Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Compass Minerals. Um, the subtitle is Who Says That Salt Mining Is Boring? Um, and uh, the format, um, given that, you know, I wasn't given specific instruction on the format, I've just got a few slides to go through. Um, feel free to uh, jump in if you have questions. Also going to save time for Q&A at the end. Um, but the idea is to go through some of my slides and then, you know, I'd be happy to get people's feedback and, um, you know, take questions uh, at the end. Um, so a little bit of safe harbor. Uh, this is not investment advice. Do your own work. Um, these opinions are mine and don't necessarily reflect those of Coast Street Capital. Can I get everybody to mute themselves? Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a four, uh, I work for a firm called Coast Street Capital. We're a long only value investor uh, located in Los Angeles, um, focused mo mostly on micro cap, small and SMID stocks. Um, I, I live in the SMID world more than anything else. Um, we, uh, we, we take a three to five year time horizon on all our investments. We are not necessarily activists, although we have run proxy battles. We consider ourselves suggestivists, which means that we are in the background in almost all of our investments, um, making suggestions about how companies can improve either in the form of capital allocation or compensation or, um, you know, IR, anything you can imagine, uh, especially in smaller companies. Um, and our three investment pillars are business value and people. So this presentation will be um, focused on, on, on those elements. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a co-portfolio manager of our small cap plus strategy. That is our SMID strategy. Um, I know this, this conference is more focused on kind of small and micro. So I chose an investment that fits squarely in small cap. Uh, it is one of our larger positions. Um, and I'm going to talk about it a little in a minute. Um, I'm about to celebrate my 10th year at Cove Street, uh, which feels like a really long time in the investment industry. I think it speaks to our culture. Um, and then for anybody who used to Follow the Inoculate Investor blog back in the day. Um, that was me. I was the guy who was crazy enough to take notes at the Berkshire meeting and post them for people. This was pre-streaming uh, pre and pre-capital IQ transcripts. So I did it all by hand. Um, so the company that we're going to talk about is uh, Compass Minerals. Um, this, these are yesterday's numbers, but I don't, I don't think anything much changed. Uh, stock price is around $71. Market cap around two, a little less than 2.4 billion. Uh, enterprise value around 3.5 billion. Uh, right now it pays about a 4% dividend, dividend yield. Um, corporate margins are in the low 20% on an EBITDA basis. And then you can't, you have to remember always that capital intensity is important. So this is a slightly capital intense business because it is a mining operation. Um, so CapEx to sales is around 7.5%. Um, so I'm going to go through the two segments and then um, I'd, be, I'd be happy to stop and, and, and because the salt segment is the most important one. So I'll, I will pause uh, at the end of this slide and see if um, people have questions. So the salt segment has uh, high 20s EBITDA margins. Um, it really, its main asset is it owns the largest underground rock salt mine in the world. It's in Ontario. It has an 83 year mine life. So it's not like, you know, only have a few years left. So this is a long lived asset. Um, the demand in North America, um, the demand in North America. Jacob just not not communicating. I just love this traffic. Um, sorry, the, the demand in North America is about 39 million tons of de-icing salt and 10 million tons of consumer and industrial salt. Um, and so that's, we're gonna talk a little bit about de-icing salt and why, that, why that's so important. Um, they also own the largest rock salt mine in the UK and they also own a smaller mine in Louisiana. So the, the main use of their salt is for de-icing. Anybody who lives in a place where it snows a fair amount or um, uh, it gets icy, you know that you, know, you can't drive and you can't walk unless people put salt on the, um, on the, uh, on the sidewalks and the roads. Um, municipalities are the main customer here. So um, every year municipalities have to kind of figure out, do we have enough inventory of salt? And if not, um, let's, 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 let's contract with Compass or one of its competitors to buy salt. Um, and so that's really the main um, use of the salt. And that's, that's why this business is very weather dependent, which we'll get into. Um, but it's also used for water treatment, chemical manufacturing, and then obviously um, rock salt can be used for, for consumption as well. 
Um, so what's interesting about salt is that the, the market structure is very favorable, meaning that in, in most markets, there are only a few players that can profitably serve the, the market. So, I mean, you have to, it's a very, it's a low value, high weight product and then shipping costs are very high. So it's a very local business. So you need either access to rail um, or, or waterways in order to go a long distance. And then in shorter distances, it can be trucked, but it's still very expensive. So it's a very local business. Um, and as a result, there just aren't that many players that can, can, can serve the market. And so if you're in you know, Bowling Green, Ohio, for example, there's probably you know, two or three players who can, who can actually serve that market. Um, so you have duopolistic and oligopolistic environments uh, in, in most of their end markets. Um, and the, the pricing power um, that comes from that is that um, there is variability in, in yearly pricing, but over the long run, salt is appreciated in price about three to 4% per year. Um, I think that's a great play if you're worried at all about inflation, um, but you need to remember that it can move around a lot based on the prior year winter. Um, it, it's pretty simple. If it snowed a lot or it was very icy and inventories are down, uh, there's a lot of pricing power. Um, if there's, um, if it hasn't snowed very much um, and inventories with the municipalities is, are, are really high, um, then the pricing power is not as strong. So that's just the kind of the way it works. Um, so let's see, where was I? Um, you know, basically this is a mission critical um, material. There's no way to, to operate in New York City, for example, without de-icing salt. So it's something that's not going away. And so what I really see is that I see this business as having irreplaceable assets, right? You have the largest rock salt mine in North America. And this business, tr you know, has traditionally traded at relatively, I would say, pedestrian multiples relative to other businesses like these. I, I compare this to the aggregates industry um, where, you know, like, like anybody who's familiar with Martin Marietta uh, materials or Vulcan materials, like those stocks trade at, I don't know, 17 to 19 times EBITDA. Um, and they're more like infrastructure assets. Um, and I think, I think the salt business specifically is more of like an infrastructure asset. Um, and, you know, the management team is aware of the, I think, underappreciation of that business um, and, and is doing everything they can to show that it is more of an infrastructure type business. Um, this is just a little bit of a, a chart on their production. Um, so uh, they have capacity uh, for, for salt in, in North America, or sorry, I think the total capacity is about 16.2 million tons, um, but the largest being at, at Goderich, which is, the, which is the mine in Ontario. Um, business, the second segment um, is a plant nutrition segment. Um, so what really happened was the old management team made a really poor acquisition of a company called Prudoquimica in Brazil. Um, and they got themselves out of, they basically, it was, they're mainly a North American and then, and then, and then UK player, and they got themselves into Brazil. And it was really a disastrous um, time. They didn't really know what they were buying and currency went against them. And um, it was just always a problem. Um, the new CEO came in in 2019 and he decided to sell um, the business. Uh, I, I will say that we pushed very, very hard for this to happen. Um, and thankfully, Kevin Crutchfield came to the decision on his own um, that they should sell this asset. So they're divesting it. They sold uh, part of it to ICL, which is the Israeli chemical company for 400 million. And then there's a sneaky good water treatment business that is still for sale um, that could get, a, I think, a multiple and a, and a valuation higher than people are expecting. Um, but that business is, is probably going to be sold imminently as well. Um, so what are you left with in plant nutrition? You literally have a monopoly um, in domestic production of um, SOP. So SOP is a sulfate of potash versus muriate of potash. Um, so if it's, it's a higher, it's, a, it's for higher value crops. A lot of people may be familiar with a company called Nutrien, which, which MOP is one of their big products. SOPs um, always trades at a premium to MOP um, because of there's, there's, there's no chlorides in it. So for drought conditions, people use SOP, um, you know, whenever, when for, for higher value crops like nuts and fruits and stuff, it's, it's a better, it's a better, um, it's a better um, potash. The issue is that um, if it gets too expensive, people just don't use it and they'll use MOP instead. So you just, you'll see pricing for SOP trade kind of in, in line in terms of the, the change um, in, in, in pricing will, will be in line with, 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 with MOP because of, because of that. Um, there's a trade-off 
if if SLP gets too high. Um, but really, the only imports are from the EU, um, and and that's and and there is no other domestic large domestic producer. So you really have a monopoly in a really high value agricultural product for gr in growing areas. If you think of like you know this isn't row crops, but the, you know people are trying to plant you know more more nuts and more fruit as people's people's taste change. Um, and so the main production comes from the Ogden, Utah evaporation ponds. They have 55,000 acres of, of ponds where they just, they, they use this evaporation process um, where the byproduct is um, SOP and salt, basically. And there's another, I think there's another byproduct as well, but um, that's, that's where you get all, the, all of the SOP that they produce. Um, and so in a normal year, they can do about 320,000 tons um, of SOP. They've talked about 380 this year. I guess there's like slightly better conditions this year. Um, and, and the issue with this business is it hasn't performed that well recently. Um, and, you know, the evaporation ponds haven't been producing um, at, a, at a margin that they've been ha happy with. Um, and so they're working on that. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's some more upside from here. So I've talked about the two business seg segments. Um, I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, Ben. Uh, yeah. can Keith, what is the third uh, byproduct of uh, SOP? There's salt. You, you've got me. It's some kind of like a magnesium chloride. I think it might be. Um, I, I, I do. It's not. It's not their biggest part of their business. So I don't actually. They, I'm sure they just set, they offload it to whoever uses mag, mag, magnesium chloride. But I think I think that's what it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the second pillar uh, of, of our investment here is, is people, and people are really important uh, in everything we do. We're always we're always really focused on people's capital allocation chops and and you know how they think about uh, you know culture and building building the company. Um, and so Kevin Cartfield came in in 2019. He worked as a coal miner before. Um, he was a CEO of um, ANR, which was a coal company. Um, if he knows anything, it's about how to run a mine. Um, and that's why we really like him. Um, and so unfortunately, the previous management team had spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they literally messed up the mine production at Goddard. They didn't, they, whatever, whoever the consultants were that told them that the CEO was more of an ag guy and whoever the, the consultants were who told them how to build the mine, they were wrong. Um, and they, they had these huge margin targets and about like all the efficiencies that they were going to get from this process and they totally blew it. Um, and so Kevin's come in and he's created what's called a diamond structure. Um, I'm not going to get into the nuances of, of, of coal mining and, or sorry, of, of salt mining. I don't necessarily understand them to the degree that, that he does, but um, they've changed the process and margins have been improving. Um, the other thing that happened with the old management team is they had terrible employee relations. So there was a strike. There was also a mine collapse where people, I think, were died um, or, or very minimal were injured. And so it was a really, you know, the Goddard mine was run pretty poorly. And all of that has been turned around. They actually just signed a, a new agreement with the, the Goddard, Goddard Union. So, um, you know, all of that has been remedied. Um, and he's also come in, as I've mentioned, he's divested non-core assets. And so he's taking the leverage down. It's down under 3x by the end of the year. Um, and I think people, this stock always traded a discount because people were ex didn't think the dividend was sustainable. Um, and, um, and, and, and amazingly, they've been able to deliver. And I don't, I mean, I don't think there's any chance they're cutting the dividend. Um, but, you know, Kevin's just maniacally focused on making Goddard more profitable and getting the plant nutrition um, uh, margins up. Um, so with the valuation, currently trades around 11, 11 times 2021 EBITDA. It's certainly not dirt cheap. Um, you know, I think whatever, you could have bought anything last year in the, in the summer, but you know, it's, it's, it's up a fair amount since then. Um, but we think this is a business that is underappreciated, that has irreplaceable assets. And if you look at, you know, there's no perfect comp, which all, I think Wall Street often has trouble with. Um, but in this case, you see, if, if you look at Martin and Vulcan, the aggregates companies, those stocks both trade already 18 times. Um, FMC and Corteva, which are um, kind of pure play, either seed, well, they're crop protection seed companies, you know, they trade over 13 times. So it trades at a discount to those. Um, it's a little bit of a hard company to DCF because tell me how much it snows next year and I'll tell you what the margins and, and cash will look like. So, you know, you kind of have to do a sum of the parts or an EBITDA base, you know, EBITDA base multiple um, to, to come up with a valuation. But, you know, I, I think the, the company has always been in the, in the, 
in the kind of the, the penalty box because of poor management and too much leverage. And I think both of those are being remedied to a very large extent. So, you know, we think the private market value right now is in the mid nineties, you know, that's like 13 times our normalized EBITDA number. Um, you know, again, not, not, not dirt cheap, but, not, but for the quality of the asset in a low rate environment, we think it's a very attractive um, situation given the opportunities for improvement when it comes to the productivity of their assets. And then obviously um, the, the margins associated with those. Um, so um, there's a couple other things going on that are really interesting. This, there's a salt mine that shut down in the South um, and CMP has been taking some of that share. Um, so they just basically competitor left the market, which is helpful, um, which, is, which is why if you just looked at their recent earnings, um, you know, their volumes were up a fair amount. Um, we also think that there'd be a lot of buyers for plant nutrition. You know, as I mentioned, it's, it's a basic monopoly in, in, in SOP and in, in domestic when it comes to domestic production. And the CEO is not an ag guy. Um, so I could see, you know, if, the, if an offer came in that was high enough that, they, you know, they would delever further um, and they'd be a pure play salt company, um, which I think, you know, it's a little easier for people to understand. Um, so just a quick summary. You know, we think they have great assets that have long lives. They generate a lot of cash. Um, they produce high margins. And as I mentioned, specifically in salt, well, I guess in both segments, they're really well competitively positioned. They're operating in duopolies and oligopolies and then in, 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 in SOP kind of a monopoly. Um, the new CEOs come in and really improve capital allocation and margins. Um, assets like these, I think, could, could fetch a very high value in the private market. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement from here. You know, the stock is probably not a multi-bagger from here. I mean, anything can happen. But really, I think the future returns will be very attractive relative to a, a market that we see is pretty expensive. Uh, and in the meantime, you get a 4% four, 4 free cash flow every year. Um, and, you know, there's also one other little thing is that there's a salt asset for sale. Um, Morton's, that, which is one of the largest competitors, is owned by company K, K plus S. And they're divesting the Morton's asset. I don't know if you know the, the Morton, you know, you ever see Morton salt on the table. Um, they're divesting that asset and they're being forced to sell their Northeast business. And I don't really know who else could really bid for it. I think CMP is in really good position to bid for it. It's not a game changer, but you always want to buy something that's a forced divestiture. Um, and so with that, I'll stop and, and take questions. Um, you, know, you can look a little more about us. Oops, that should say, <laughs> that website should say covestreetcapital.com. Um, you can see my email address there. Um, and also follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter. I promise you, I'm not, I'm not tweeting about Bitcoin. I'm talking about securities that we own and, and, and invest in. And, um, you know, I like to think of us as, as, as investors and not, not speculators. Um, so with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Ben, is uh, that Twitter address correct though? Yeah, inoculated invest. Yeah, it, it, it goes back to my old blogging days where I was the inoculated investor. Got it. Any questions? You answered mine yesterday. <laughs> Do you know who, who owned the company before it went public? Was it a private equity owner? Um, you're talking about uh, CMP? Um, yes. So this, this was, uh, I, I, I need to go back, but this was a originally part of FMC um, which is another one of our holdings. Um, this was initially part of FMC. Uh, and I think that it was in private hands, in, in pro potentially private equity until it went public. So I think you're right there. But this goes, this goes way back to like, you know, FMC as a conglomerate days. Was it a company called Winchurch, a private equity firm called Winchurch? Canadian? You know, I'd, ha I'd have to go back. We haven't owned it that long that I, I haven't gone back that far. I don't, okay. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Very interesting, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting set of businesses. I think they're underappreciated. Again, I, I, I just, there aren't many assets out there. There's no comp, so it, it's a little hard for people to say this is what it should be worth. But so you kind of have to triangulate and look at similar businesses that generate similar margins and have similar competitive positions. And we just think that it trades a large discount to those. Um, so that's one last question. Do they sure. have? a strong enough balance sheet to make 
acquisitions? So, you know, until very recently, the answer was absolutely not um, because they had, they levered up where well, they'd spent, they'd spent a bunch of money on Protochimica, which was the Brazilian asset um, that they got crushed by the currency. And it just, even, even if there was growth, it was all eaten up by currency and they just, they didn't run it particularly well either. So it wasn't generating a lot of cash. So it wasn't a great, you know, it, it, it didn't help them at all. And the other thing is they did, they blew all that money on the, on the mine construction. And so that literally, they just, that money just poofed um, because they, they built the mine the wrong way. So they were over levered. Um, it was one of my, my, my favorite pushbacks against my colleagues um, was why we shouldn't own this because um, we owned it in one of our other strategies. And I, I hadn't put it in this strategy because I didn't like the balance sheet. Um, and so, so what Kevin's come in and done, he's gotten the operations and, and EBITDA in the core businesses up. And then by divesting for um, it's a it's a nice delevering event. So they're gonna they, they they've guided to be at two point seven five to three times levered by the end of the year. Um, so I think they could make a deal. Um, you know I don't think I don't I don't really want this business to be forex levered again. So um, I would I would hope that they would focus on deals where there are strong synergies and kind of like bolt ons as opposed to some kind of transformational deal. You know I I think personally and this is just my opinion that the the real opportunity is to um, monetize the SOP business. I don't think Kevin Crutchfield has ever been a huge fan of the, and, and you know, he's not an ad guy. I, I know he didn't like the, the, the South American business, but I don't think he's ever loved the SOP business, but there were, but he's also not gonna sell it when it's underperforming. Um, and so they're working on getting the evaporation ponds and their inventory management in, in SOP to be better. Um, I think that would be the opportunity, monetize that, um, assuming that there's a tax, you know, there's not a whole lot of tax le leakage. And then you could think about what in the world is this company going to be? And I don't know, you, you can ask yourself this question, does, does it make sense to be a pure play salt miner? Because one of the issues with this company, as we've discussed, is that you've got this variability in cash flows. I look at this as a perfect private asset. You know, if, I, if, if, if you were a private owner, you wouldn't care if it snowed I mean, if you, there was, if, if you know, Andrew asked, I think, or, or, or the, somebody asked me a good question about yesterday about, you know, global warming and how does that impact it? You know, I, I think of the, it as, as climate change is leading to more variable weather. And so, you know, we just had ice storms in Texas, which were unprecedented. So clearly it's not necessarily a, 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 a home run to say that the world is warming and we're in less salt. Um, but my, my point is, in, in any year, it could snow or it could not snow, but as a private owner, you don't really care as long as you're not overlevered. Um, it's just a little bit of a weird public company because you're going to have this period where, you know, you're going to have some periods where it snows like crazy and pricing power is going to look great. Um, and then the next year it doesn't. And so people try to figure out what the run rate cash flows are for this company. And it's a little bit hard to do. So um, they, they're either going to have to, you know, buy something else to allow them to have a, a little bit more diverse earning stream, or I think this would be a perfect private asset or uh, you know, either private equity or family, or even, you know, even a segment within a larger organization that doesn't have, um, you know, th that, that, that doesn't have the variability and it doesn't, it doesn't, there doesn't need the cash flows. So if it doesn't snow in one year, it's not a big deal. Do, do they have the money to acquire Morton's? Not the whole thing. Um, there's a company called Stone Canyon. Stone Canyon's the one who's who's buying. I, we don't know whether they bid on it. We haven't. I don't, management has not been willing to tell us whether they bid on the Morton's asset. I mean, from from what I understand about the Morton's asset, it's more of a consumer business, and so I think they're more focused on, in general, the the municipality business, the de-icing salt business. Uh -huh. um, so I, I do think they, that they they certainly have the bandwidth to bid on this divestiture that's happening with the northeastern Morton's asset, but they they did not they, they either didn't bid or they didn't they didn't go after or they didn't win the um the 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 auction for the um the the Morton asset. Isn't Stone Canyon the Davis family office? I don't I, like Chris Davis, like um, uh, Marvin Davis and his son. Yeah, I, I don't know them. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. They're That's LA oil. Based. Oil. Yeah. Oh well, I, they do a lot more than oil, but and they have Stone Canyon is a, one of their investment entities. I just don't know if it's the same one. Yeah.
Interesting. Well, Any I, other questions I, about CP? I, Go ahead. I thank you. I, I think that was a very, very good, concise presentation and an interesting situation. Okay. Well, absolutely feel free to reach out to me um, if you want. You know, I'm happy to send you the slides or I'm happy to follow up if, if people have questions. Um, can you, if it's public, can you say what your basis was or where your investment oh. started? Is that not public? Yeah, it's 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 not public because we don't have a we we're, we don't have a mutual fund in this strategy. So um, okay, okay. Anybody else? I mean, I'm happy to answer more about CNP. I'm happy to <laughs> if people want another idea. Happy to talk about another idea. Just just let me know. What else do you like that's smaller? What's give me some market cap um, parameters? Micro cap, yeah. so less yeah. than a billion. Yeah, um, you know we might call it. So we have at Cove Street we have concentric circles. We all work on small cap because that's our core strategy. And then I, you know, I co-manage a mid strategy, and then we have micro as well. And I'm on the like the, that's the other side of the concentric circle that I don't really touch. Um, so. I I don't I under I know those names, but I don't feel comfortable, you know, representing them the way that that <laughs> that I think my colleagues would 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 expect me to be would hope for that I could be able to do in in a forum like this. So um, okay. I don't have a lot to tell you on the microcap side. Okay. Um, you think this company is uh, destined to be sold? Pretty yeah. Soon? Yeah, I, I, again, I don't think this makes sense as a public company. It doesn't, it doesn't check the boxes. I mean, unless it's like a REIT or something like that, unless you like, you can turn it into a SALT REIT, which I, that would, I think the IRS would have a little bit of a problem with that. Um, it's just too, the cash flows are too variable. And so people want growth. People want consistent growth. People want margin expansion. People want, you know, visibility and cash flows going forward. It's just really tough. Um, to get that here. And so I don't think, I, it, this, I think that's one of the reasons why this business has, has you know, it's not traded at, at, you know, three times even, it's not been heated to that degree, but I just think it's never gotten the, uh, the appreciation it deserves given the scarcity of the asset base. And it's because of those, those variable cash flows. So, yeah, I, I think, again, I don't, I don't, I don't see this as a public company, you know, in the same structure in five years. I just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. And I don't think, I don't think Kevin Crutchfield um, is, you know, is, is like in the seat forever kind of guy. Like he would, he would monetize this asset if the price were right. R Richard, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. What, what's the symbol? CMP. C Charlie, Mary, Peter. And where is it? Where is it traded or listed? U.S. What exchange is it on? Is it on? It sounds like it's on the New York or. Yeah, I think it's on the. Um, I think it's on the New York Stock Exchange. And and what's the current price? Um, here, I, if you missed it, I have a slide here. It's uh, seventy-one dollars. Market cap's about two point four billion U.S. Mm -hmm. Another question. Uh, what's the what's the average free cash yield, or what's the free cash yield in an average snow yeah. weather year? Yeah. So I mean, it's a little hard to say the to tell you the answer to that because tell me Kevin's come in and made it a lot more productive, and so I think they'll generate better cash going forward. Um, oh. But I mean, right now, if, if they're going to do a hundred to, I'd be able like a hundred to one hundred twenty million in free cash flow. That's like a four percent yield on on enterprise value, and then like whatever five to six percent on on equity. So not insanely cheap, right? This isn't like ten times free cash flow, but I mean, we think given the quality of the assets um, and the potential improvement that we're seeing in cash flows as they've gotten much better at inventory management, working capital management, um, you know, we, we think that those cash flow numbers numbers could go up over time, and this business can generate, you know, like a, whatever whatever metric you want to use, either net income 
for free cash flow to net income or or free cash flow to EBITDA will go up over time as 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 they 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 basically figure out how to manage the mines a little better. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, hope it was helpful. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about myself or CMP or Cove Street. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe I can do it again in another event. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.